Hello everyone. Good to be back in for masterclass number seven. Uh, we got five pieces by three composers. Um, before we get started, I just want to say that I expect many submissions because we're all stuck inside. Uh, or at least we all should be stuck inside these days. <laughs> anyway, I hope everyone out there is staying as safe and as healthy as possible during this outbreak, hopefully watching a lot of YouTube as well. And notice a couple things are different. One, I have my live stream set up, um, but I'm not actually doing a live stream. Uh, I'm not at my usual place uh, anymore, which has a very fast internet um, due to the outbreak. I am back uh, at my parents' house, and uh, their internet's pretty good, but it's not quite as good. Uh, I didn't want any technical difficulties during these live streams, as is wont to happen. So first up, we have a piece by Paulo Moena, I do hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, uh, who writes in, Hi Classical Nerd, English is not my native language, so I apologize beforehand for any mistakes in my writing. I'm studying piano at a conservatory, and I started to compose since March of 2019. I've composed nine polyphonic pieces for piano, and I'm sending you the one that is the most harmonically complex. Thanks for your time and work. So, here it is. First of all, I would say your English is absolutely fine. Uh, it's a funny language because it's sort of like tying a tie. Like it's pretty simple to get the hang of the basics, um, since there aren't grammatical cases or like a TV distinction, like a lot of languages have. Um, but it's very difficult to perfect. Uh, there are so many exceptions to the rules that I think a lot of non-native speakers think that they're worse at English uh, than they actually are. Um, they, people tend to assume they make more mistakes than they actually do because there's a lot of exceptions. So uh, don't worry about your English. The first thing that strikes me about this piece, I have it on a different screen here, uh, are the slurs, uh, which this means different things to different instruments. So Chopin, for instance, you look at one of Chopin's scores and you'll see a slur over like two or three systems. Uh, this business of legato on a piano is a fantastic misnomer because the piano is really incapable of sustaining a sound in a way that any other instrument is. Uh, so slurs in piano music, uh, they, they tend to be more like phrase markings in a way. Um, especially consider when you have repeated notes under slurs. Uh, so, or, you know, around this section right here. How exactly do you want that to be played? Um, I mean, it's right here. Uh, it's also in... Da, 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 da. Here, I mean, assuming that this is still under the slur effect. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, assuring, I'm assuming that this slur indicates legato in both voices. And if you want uh, the lower voice more detached, I would put some markings in there, staccato or portato markings. But here in measure 9, you've got these repeated Fs. Or right here, you have these repeated A's. You have to detach those somehow. Like, you ha there's not going to be a totally legato connection between those two. So the question should be, how do you want those to be articulated? If I were faced with playing this, I would probably detach those, be more of a portato, so there'd be a slight, slight break in the sound between the two, just for the purposes of bringing my finger up and then restriking the note. But that might not be what you want there. So that's something to consider. The second thing about your slurs is that they tend to jump around between voices, which strikes me as sort of a Hauptstimme notation. So you might find this in Schoenberg's or Berg's music. And I don't think you want a stark difference in articulation between what is and isn't under 
the slurs. It does seem like it's more of a phrase or even motive marking here. I don't think you necessarily have to do this because a lot of performers of heavily polyphonic music are going to do this anyway. Like, you don't need to assure that everything is going to be exactly legato in this way. There's always been a lot of controversy over whether or not, for instance, you know, Bach should be played on the piano. And while older instruments have made a comeback, uh, typically when you're playing it on the piano, you do try to bring out the motive, say, the, the subject of a fugue, for instance. So if you're really concerned about making sure that your performers articulate the important motives of this polyphonic piece, uh, I think they're going to do that anyway. But if you're really concerned about that, or you want them to bring it out in some way, uh, I don't think they really could, or, or you would want for them to articulate it differently, per se. Um, but if you really want to assure that they're going to be bringing that out, uh, a little footnote will suffice. Especially problematic is when the slurs touch each other, so here... Uh, to a lesser extent there, um, don't, don't, don't do this. Um, there's, there's really no reason for this to happen. Uh, this indicates to me that these are more phrase or motive markings than, than true legato markings. Also be aware of what direction your stems are going. Uh, so I'm especially looking at right here in measure 9 and 10. Um, even the terrible notation softwares, the default will be if the stems, well, the stems should be pointing up if they're below the central line. Uh, so in the bass clef, that would be below that central D. Also, typically you don't cross the middle of your bar with a note value. You want to be able to basically slice your measures in half. Uh, and this, you pretty much do this, um, except measure 16 is an example of something that I might consider renotating. Uh, the middle voice here, I've seen this more often, um, it's not quite as bad. It's basically this elongated like scotch snap rhythm. I'll take it. I, I'm more happy with this now. Uh, I mean, you certainly do have dotted values uh, going across the center of the bar. If this were, say, a uh, dotted half over here and this quarter note were over there. Um, so it's not the hard and fast rule, but typically you don't want to see things like this. Um, attacks on the second beat or somewhere that's not on the first beat that's being held over, um, not for the continuous duration of the bar. Sometimes you'll see like quarter, half, quarter. That's fine. Um, you're basically doing this long um, emphasis on the second beat. A little bit of a syncopation there. Um, it's not really heard as a syncopation because it's always long unless your measures are going by really fast. Uh, what I'm thinking is here specifically. Uh, ideally you want something on the third beat, even if there's something articulated. Um, so this should be a quarter tied to an eighth, and this should be a beam group of eighth notes going down. Also, voice crossing. I get that this is a strict sort of early 18th century keyboard style, just visually. Um, you see a lot of this kind of stuff, for instance, um, in Bach. Like if you look at our text to Bach scores, sometimes you'll see like three voices all in the same staff and in the same rhythm, but they're all individually stemmed to preserve the individuality of each note. And that, it makes it very hard to read. Stylistically, um, theoretically, analytically, it makes a lot more sense to do that way. Um, the downside is that it's practically unreadable and you get a lot of notes that have to be offset from one another, even though they're supposed to be played at the same time and essentially they are a chord. Um, but be, in order to preserve the individuality can't say that word either. The individuality of each voice, you have to stem all of them individually, if that makes any sense. Uh, that's what a lot of the you know 18th century style was about. Um, I don't think that you necessarily have to do that here. I, 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 I truly believe that there is an easier solution than trying to basically invert your notes. I mean, well, well when I'm, what I say, what I mean by that is. I mean, throughout here, for the first three beats, your stems are all in the wrong direction. And I get that you're trying to show that your um, motives are going in different places. That That's fine. Um, it's fine for analytical and stylistic purposes. You're actually trying to read the dang thing, <laughs> and it can actually be a little bit of a challenge. Um, I would say measure 20 is fine mostly because they're the same rhythm. Measure 21... Also fine. Where you're really running into trouble here is measure 25. Um, it takes a second because you, I mean, you can sort of read this because 
um, it's almost like a tablature. You know, there's a certain uh, there's a ratio between each of the notes here. You can you can kind of figure out what's up, uh, you, what rhythm is supposed to be. But for a performer who's trying to figure out um, what lines to bring out, it's going to be difficult to do that. Because, like for instance, this slur, uh, what's it going to? It starts in the stem down note, ends on this stem down note. So really, what you're bringing out with this lower slur is the down stemmed voices, which are all above the lower lower voices, which are stemmed up. It's a small thing, um, but practically, um, it's a it looks a little not great, um, and it's kind of difficult to read. Um, so I, you know, I get totally why you did it. Um, I'm trying to think of an easier way to do this. Uh, you have some dotted lines to indicate the voices, uh, flip flop stems for that bar might be helpful. Uh, so if you had like uh, trouble, this is on a system break. If you had a dash line here going down and this dash line going up, you could easily flip the stemming in this bar alone. These would be upside down, but then you could easily do the same thing and crisscross there. I don't know. That, that might also be a little too much, but uh, something to think about, especially when you're putting this in front of a performer um, and wanting them to perform it to the best extent possible. Structurally speaking, I think this piece is just fine. Like Stylistically, you're going for this canonic, fugal, generally polyphonic keyboard texture. Um, and I'd almost want to see you change the beginning a little bit. So what I'm talking about this is that you have two bars of introduction, not kind of this little um, tiny fourth of a measure here, because it doesn't really count. Um, you have just in the soprano, and then you bring in the second voice, and the third voice really comes in prominently here. Okay, first of all, you need to... <laughs> you're missing a rest here, I just noticed that. <laughs> it's not my notes that are done on this screen versus the big screen. So. It's a very complicated operation. You have these half notes right here, right? Um, and this undercuts a lot of your potential. Like the reason that a lot of fugues start out with just one voice and then a second voice enters and then a third voice enters and then if there's a fourth voice that comes in a little bit later is that there is a great deal of tension and excitement that's inherent in each of the entrances of those voices. So having these half notes here undercuts that potential profoundly. You're also harmonically, you're underpinning a line that does not need to be harmonically underpinned. I get why you did it though. I mean, it probably sounded weird going from one voice to three voices, but that just means that and there's nothing wrong with a little bit of convention, including a few more measures in here and, uh, you know, waiting to bring in the middle voice or the lower voice, uh, you know, getting rid of this and expanding the intro. Or well, perhaps if you don't want to do that, cut the bass line from here all the way to there, then have it kind of arise out of here so you don't have this big banging bass entrance. So then you have more complex texture through here, that drops out, and then you have like a truly bass bass entrance, because this really isn't, I mean it's the bass voice, but it's not in the bass register, then you save that really low B flat uh, for a really fun um, and potentially very dramatic entrance here, uh, where you don't expect it because it's on a weak beat. Next we have two pieces by Uncle Phil, a longtime viewer. Phil writes in, I watch your videos all the time and thought you might take a look at my work. I'm a 63-year-old self-taught composer from Rochester, New York. And here we have To and Fro. Thank you. 
quite know where to begin with this piece because it doesn't seem to me like this piece is intended to be played. The gestures don't really work well at the keyboard and the engraving seems to be more to get the playback to sound right as opposed to crafting something that can be interpreted by another performer. Like, so these 30 second notes, um, realistically, if you want someone to play this, uh, you'd put a staccato or a staccatissimo marking in there. And um, I can really go through here and respell everything in a more orderly fashion, but I'm not going to because I just don't think that's the goal here. Um, there's also the inclusion of the synthesizer. I would like to see more of the synthesizer, actually. Uh, you could potentially have more sustained sounds on a synth than you can on the piano. Um, and it seems like all you're doing here uh, is using it as like a second piano. Um, there's not a whole lot of material that's uh, unique to each instrument. And it might be something you could use to shape the form as well. Um, because speaking of form, I, I'm sorry, I just do not get the trajectory of this piece. Um, it sounds to me like it's a collection of small little phrases and gestures. They're just like concatenated together. Um, there's a lot of repetition between segments um, because things come back. Um, don't not go to copy and paste, but the logic behind the structure of what comes after what just it, it, it completely eludes me. Now, let's talk about harmonic language a little bit. It's consistent in that using a lot of the same chord shapes a lot of the time, and then just moving them up and down. Uh, but you have to be really careful about this technique because it can easily, easily sound copied and pasted and moved around. So Debussy liked this technique, um, but at the same time, he's very particular about the voice leading. So even if he doesn't care too much about having parallel octaves or fifths, frankly, I don't want this to come across as rude, but the way you're using this technique here makes for an end result that is something that sounds a lot more like random notes. I mean, you could have a system behind it. I mean, for all I know, um, there is something rather rigorous behind it. But there are a lot of sections that sound like they're just composed of individual dyads or triads that may sound fine on their own. But it's the context of them that makes almost every sonority sound out of place. Like it's a just a non sequitur with a previous chord that doesn't really lead into the next one. Um, there doesn't seem to be a logical flow from section to section or even from note to note, dyad to dyad, chord to chord. If you're going for that, great. You've, you've succeeded. Next is A Walk in the Park, also by Uncle Phil.
So I immediately like this a lot better. It has more clearly defined sections, and the open synthesized sonorities really, really work. Again, I see this as in sort of a French Impressionist world. You see the harmonies, you got the voice leading, you got the running notes. And I can tell you already you like all these little fast gestures that end on longer notes. And frankly, I think they really work here for the most part. Um, towards the end of the repeated middle section, um, I, want to hear, I want to hear some variation on it a little bit. Maybe a different pattern, something longer or shorter. Um, it just sounded a little copied and pasted by the time you got to about this point. Um, but not nearly so much so as in the first piece. Uh, and your use of notation software as not really notation software, but more to write music that's intended to be played back using the software um, is really quite effective here. There is that flute gesture with the double flats. Let's see if I can, yeah, here. Um, uh, why? Um, so I'm also basing my critiques off of the fact that this isn't intended to be played or at least not played in its current state, um, and using the playback to pl write something that's, that's totally fine. Uh, but that just means there's no reason whatsoever to use a double flat. Uh, they should be as rare as possible anyway, given that a preponderance of them means there's an easier way to spell it, or you're Nikolai Roslovets, and you should have some kind of arcane system of synthesizing scales. Um, doesn't seem that you have that here, and even if you did, there's no reason to spell it if you're just trying to get the right playback. Um, it seems like just a wholesale transposition um, gone a little a little too far out of whack. But the, the faster gestures and the voice leading here seems a lot more directed than it did in the first piece. I wouldn't say that it doesn't necessarily sound goal-oriented in this piece either. And this strikes at the heart of like French versus German approaches and aesthetics. Particularly in the time of Debussy and Ravel, and when the French were really trying to create their own sound world away from the Germans. Um, I mean, they've never liked each other anyway. <laughs> German voice leading was, like, German voice leading is very strongly goal-oriented. Um, whereas a lot of, again, going back to Debussy, a lot of Debussy's music, each chord sounds like, oh, this logically follows the last chord, but in a way that doesn't have this inevitability about it. Uh, you don't have the same kind of tension and release in French music of that period, um, at least not in the same way. And I'm sensing a lot of that same aesthetic here. I think a lot of what you did really well in this piece could be applied back to to and fro uh, to make that piece a lot better as well. Finally, we have two pieces by Hunter Wentz, who writes in, uh, I'm a high school student with no experience learning composition, but trusting my ear and having an idea of what I'd like the piece to sound like, I decided to give it a swing. After a heavy obsession with Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, I wanted to find ways I could best imitate his ability to showcase exposed instrumentation and individuality, yet still present harmonies in a simpler, more retained fashion. As you can tell, I like working with harmonic minor keys, as they are the simplest and most enchanting for me. Uh, so first up by Hunter is Lesion for Wind Quintet, so let's give that a listen.
So this isn't a wind quintet. Um, this is perhaps a double wind quintet, or even a small wind ensemble piece. Uh, reason being that instruments like these, you just can't play more than one note in a way that you want them to. I might think through this part right here again, especially this transition to measure nine. You have a lot of flowing ideas, and then you drop that for an ostinato that in comparison to what came before, it's just not remarkably interesting. Um, and you're also asking for some serious chops from your clarinetist. So clarinets are unique among woodwind instruments in that uh, they do have a very wide range, and they have a really good dynamic control. But when you get to extreme registers um, and asking for that kind of control, uh, you're really asking for a professional clarinetist. Um, what I'm specifically concerned about here is this jump from mezzo forte to pianissimo in measure 9. Um, that might be difficult, especially with that leap up. But then you have uh, a swell from pianissimo to forte on that really high note. Uh, I, I definitely don't think you want forte there. Maybe mezzo forte, at least. Um, because that's just going to keep being repeated. And then if you have uh, an ostinato that continues on, that it's supposed to... Uh, go from all that dynamic variation down to pianissimo, both in the flute and the clarinet. I mean, you're asking for two real extremes of dynamics when you're talking about that very, very top range. By the way, this repeat notation that I'm seeing here, the starting in measure 11, isn't used in scores these days, really. I mean, it's good shorthand if you're writing by hand, and it makes total sense when scores had to be typeset. Um, but just copy and paste it out, really, especially if you're changing dynamics underneath it. A little further down, uh, the oboe is sort of in the complete opposite situation of the clarinet. Um, we have a swell from mezzo forte to fortissimo. It doesn't have a particularly wide range. Uh, you're not supposed to really use the low range of the oboe. It has a kind of honking quality. It's very different. It speaks very differently from the rest of the instrument. And the very high range gets very pinched and also hard to control in its own way. So you really have kind of two octaves to work with-ish, um, kind of from from low D or E up until the high C or so. You do see excerpts in the oboe literature that go higher than that. Um, but for most players, I think high C is a good point. You, you have to really think about what you want uh, if you're really committed to going above that um, because you, you're not entirely assured that you're going to get the same quality of sound either way. So even a great player is going to have a difficulty of time getting dynamic nuance when it gets to that range. All that being said, I just think the high D in measure 13 is pushing it. You're still mostly at a mezzo forte. I mean, you're just starting your your crescendo there. It's going to pop out. It's it's going to be... I think it's just going to be... It's going to sound strained. Um, and it, it just... I'm just not sure that's the sound you, you really want to go for there. I'm also thinking you could have a little bit more rhythmic nuance in this same section. Measures 13 and 14 specifically, because I mean, you have this ostinato that you set up in the flute and clarinet. You know, this is a single reed and a no reed instrument. Then you have this double reed coming in. Then a little bit later, you have the low double reed coming in. You know, I just feel like there's more opportunities for 16th notes here or offsetting things. So instead of da, 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 da. You know, you go da 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 da. Structurally, you have a really long first ending. Like we have to keep in mind that you have what four measures of intro, then you have a first ending that is extremely long, then you repeat literally just the first four measures, and then you jump all the way to here. If you expand this, it'll have to be conducted, and this is going to be extremely difficult for a conductor, and even for players. It's going to require, perhaps depending on the complexity of your parts, some highlights, sticky notes, post-it notes. I I've seen it all. Because you're dealing with only four repeated measures, just include those right here where you have the repeat. There there's, there's no reason not to. I get why you would do this from a historical perspective. I get why it was instantiated in the first place, because when you're engraving things by hand, you want to speed up the process. Um, but it's always been in the pain in the butt for conductors and a lesser extent for the players, but especially when you have a really long first ending, a really long ending in general, and uh, you have to go back. It, unless there's a really, really good reason to do that, to save um, a certain amount of paper or ink, just just don't do it. You're already killing trees to begin with. Fortissimo in the horn. 
starting in the second ending. Yeah, if you want a brassier sound that stands out, you don't have to go to a really big dynamic like that. Uh, the technique um, is in French, so I don't entirely know how to pronounce it, but it looks like uh, Quirve, Q-U-I-R-V-E with a accent mark on it, um, which just means brassy. So it translates to. Uh, it gets a brighter and brassier sound, but it does so without resorting to extreme dynamics, which in this case is triple forte and accent coming straight off of a staccato uh, pianissimo note. And it's not in a difficult part of the range at all, uh, but that's exactly why you want to avoid those extreme dynamics. Really giving any brass instrument something louder than F requires some extraordinary circumstances because you will not hear almost anything else. I'm not entirely sure about what you're going for these with these 30 second notes in the flute. You can certainly double or triple tongue that, so technically I'm not concerned, but stylistically it just seems like it, it's a real break from what came before without much of a transition. And this is the same problem I had with you moving to the excuse me, the ostinato earlier. It just seemed like you're dropping off something, not really transitioning from one idea to the next, but simply cutting a lot of stuff off, in this case, uh, at the downbeat of measure 21, and introducing a new idea. And it does seem like, at least in this case, uh, you might have had something here before that was of more interest, because otherwise you would have a half rest instead of a bunch of quarter rests there. And I would like to see a little bit more extending, maybe even some more measures between measures 20 and 21, uh, to try to make it seem like everything's not just cutting off and you're you're getting to this low bassoon note starting in 21. Um, and there might be a way to like more effectively um, connect these two ideas in two sections. Moving on slightly, um, I do like this really offbeat stuff in the flute here. Uh, if you expand this, I would suggest piccolo. Um, if you're just if you're doing a double wind quintet, you can have one of the flutists play the piccolo instead. Um, maybe some grace notes around it, um, or above it, or below it, or maybe even two piccolos kind of playing these these little um, dissonant dyads, you know, poking them out uh, of nowhere. If you expand to full wind ensemble, then you could have percussion. Um, you could have flute there, but maybe punctuate with glockenspiel or triangle or some high metal to kind of really poke that out of the texture even more than it already does, um, which has a great sort of bounciness to it. Triplets in the flute here. Um, for one thing, these brackets can go on the other side. Um, but the triplets in the flute starting in measure 39, I would get rid of the low A's. So the jumps can be tricky, um, and if you stick them in another instrument, I mean, you could. You could stick them in another instrument if you really want them. All the low flute stuff is just going to be buried. Like this line here, um, which you know rhythmically is is in unison with the with the clarinet. I don't think you're going to hear the flute there. The flute just does not project in its low and middle range. Uh, it just it it has a very difficult time being heard above a lot of different textures. So I don't think you're going to lose anything by dropping the A out in those low that lower A in measure 39. Finally, I liked this interleaved orchestration at the end. I think you could use more clarinet and less horn. So see on the top, you're going flute, that really high flute. Um, then you have in the middle oboe, a really, I think it would be a pretty nice note for an oboe. Um, then below that you have the flute kind of rounding that sound. So the top notes are flute, oboe, flute. So the, it's like an oboe sandwich. And then the flute is the, uh, the bread. You have horn, clarinet and horn, horn, bassoon. So the sounding D above middle C, which is what you're going to get in this, the second note, in the, so the second horn and the clarinet, um, because of the transpositions, that's going to be the sounding D above middle C. That's going to be emphasized, because it's the only note here that you're doubling in any way. So drop that out there. So drop the second horn out, and your clarinet's going to have an easier time coloring the sound. Um, it's going to be able to come through on its own instead of trying to blend in with the horn. Alternatively, even though this is a very good range for the horn, um, again, the horn has a very difficult time blending in in this quintet arrangement, um, even the best of times. So you could easily give that middle D to the second bassoon, if you include a second bassoon in an expansion of this, so that we have this really wide sound at the bottom. And that's really good because you want wider space intervals on the bottom, and then you, you really do have this freedom to um, have 
tighter sonorities of the top. In this case, you would have a tighter sonority in the middle because you would still have that sounding F sharp above the middle C. Um, well, there's no middle C, but like it's the F sharp above the middle C, as I'm saying. Uh, you would still have that as a as a thicker texture, that third coloring that. So you still have the intervals uh, there, um, but you would have two octaves of D in the bassoon. And you, but you're missing that central one, so you get that really low bassoon sound, you get really high bassoon sound, um, which both are really good ranges for the bassoon is also a really high, really good range. It's a really good and unique sounds for the bassoon. Uh, so you're almost having two different colors, even though it's the same instrument. Then, what what would I do here? I'd also add another clarinet, perhaps. Um, maybe, maybe even have bassoon horn bassoon on the bottom. Um, like, maybe this, maybe the third horn, which is taking the uh, A. Yeah, that, that would stay the same. So that, that could go between the bassoon, so you could have this bassoon horn sandwich on the bottom, where the bassoon is the bread, and the horn is like stuffed in the middle there with that A. Um, I think that could work quite nicely. And then you just have the one sounding F sharp, which is nice because a lot of beginning composers think that they have to just litter their th chords with thirds. You don't really need to do this because you don't need that many thirds or if you're using sevenths or ninths or any other like coloristic quality uh, or coloristic note in a chord or of a you know, traditional uh, tertial harmony. People usually think that you need a lot of those. You don't really. Uh, you just need one, maybe two, if you really want to be special. Otherwise, it seems like it might seem sound overbalanced. So in terms of note placement, this is actually really good already. What I'm mostly afraid of is that there's just too much horn and that you can just tweak the low end a slight little bit uh, to make it sound even better. I do question the ability for the flute to get a true pianissimo at the end, um, and to a lesser extent the oboe, but I think um, I think overall this the, the ending of this is, is pretty nice. Next by Hunter and last today is a flute choir piece called Moderato. So let's give that a listen. Like I felt with the first piece, you have these great textures going, and then you have a tendency to just drop them out in spots, um, such as measure 9 to 10. You have these lower voices that just, that where do they go? They don't, they don't go anywhere. The fact that you're thinning out the texture here is a good idea, because you can't keep this going forever, especially in woodwinds. Um, but there's there's got to be a better way than everything essentially cutting off right before a downbeat. Like, you know, extending some of these lines across the downbeat, uh, taking some of them out before the the end. You know, that would be a really uh, interesting way to to handle that. Or just stick a few more measures in there um, and create a, a, a gradual drop off of from from all these flutes going in measure nine to just two going in measure ten. But also, you have this low chord coming in in measure eleven. So I'm wondering if there might be an easy way for you to continue one of these lines, slow it down a little bit underneath everything else that's going on top, and then kind of connect that to this chord that's coming in on measure 11. Also, the 11 tuplet here in measure 
10 going into the triplets and on the downbeat of measure 11. Might just be personal taste. That just seems odd to me and kind of incongruent would be the word I'd use. And I was talking about some of the difficulties in writing for flute, especially low flute earlier. Um, the problem is ameliorated when you're dealing with only flutes because you have a consistent sound. Even in a large flute choir, uh, you're going to have some difficulty projecting the lower range. It's not going to be as difficult because you're not trying to cut through a bunch of different tone qualities and different timbres. Um, high flute does sound significantly different from low flute, but they don't sound you know, worlds apart like a flute and an oboe do. Even though you're dealing with only flutes, you've got this octave doubled line here in the first and second flutes starting in measure 12. I'm just not sure how much of the lower line you're going to get once you're below the middle of the staff. So once you're past, you know, the, the halfway point in measure 12, you know, a more effective use might be in more interesting harmony than just straight up octaves, because you know, I'm seeing a lot of different flutes here. You have four, no, sorry, five flutes and one piccolo. Um, there is a lot of room for very interesting textures, very interesting harmonies you can bring out. Um, there's no real need to double a lot of lines. And octaves, uh, you know, coming from a, a pianist's perspective, octaves are pretty easy to do. They add some brightness and some color to it. Um, with flutes, especially flute ensemble, you're not going to get a whole lot from the lower line. Um, the upper line is going to be colored by the lower line instead of vice versa because the, the range of the flute just brightens up so much when you get up up to the to the higher higher range. Yeah, I just think there's a more interesting solution here, and just a more interesting thing to do with that poor second flute than to just double what the first flute's doing. I like the tying over of the bar line here in 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 this system, especially measures 17 to 18. Um, and then at the end, with 19 through 20, going into the next system, um, makes things less metrical. And it's a trick a lot of beginning composers don't do because you sort of feel um, enslaved to the meter in a certain way. Low piccolo, um, cool sound, cool sound. Uh, and this gives you a really interesting octave doubling, especially in measure 20, with the second flute. Um, this th That I'm okay with. Problem with the low piccolo is that you just cannot hear it um, if there's a whole lot going on. Yeah, especially here in this last little bit. It, I can tell this piece is unfinished, but you know, measures 28, 29, you know, you get you get on the staff uh, with the piccolo. You know, towards the top of the staff, okay, you're good. Below the bottom half of the staff, like that low, that lowest octave, really cool, airy, breathy sound. Um, you know, really neat. I love utilizing it, but you have to pick your spots because it's just not going to project. Oh, again, I suggest expanding this piece to some degree. Um, I would say at least two piccolos to expand your upper range, and you can help reinforce that lower register when you really want it. Um, I would also say that you really only need three or four flutes here because there's a lot of doubling going on at a given time when you're using all of the, of the five flutes. There's always something going on that can be changed or tweaked. So if you're not going to add more, you know, interesting harmonies, add more textures to it, I think you could get away with condensing it to, to four or even three flutes. Um, and you also don't have an alto or bass flute, which, yeah, they can be a little clunky. They can be kind of hard to use because of again balance and projection issues. You know, getting that really low register of the flute takes a little while for it to speak. Um, and this is especially true when you're trying to do chords, such as you have, you know, here in, in this last little bit, uh, you know, measure 28 onwards. Um, that's a little easier to do because they're all coming on downbeats and it's very regular. But if you're trying to do, like, things that are in rhythmic unison, um, that are coming at unexpected times and places where, you know, the alto or bass with players can't get to a groove, sometimes you can have them not speak at the same time, which can be a little bit of an issue. Um, it's really more of an issue for the performers and the conductors to figure out than the composer, even though it's something that, you know, we have to be aware of, like potential issues. What those instruments give you, I love the alto flute, I love the bass flute especially, um, they give you such a rich character to the low end, and it just, it, it gives you this extra octave below your, your the standard, you know, middle C on the flute, or I don't know if you have a, you're calling for a B foot here at all. Um, oh yeah, you do here in uh, measure 22. 
in the fifth flute. But you're still you're, that's still you're talking about a seventh below that. Like that's still it, it, it's it's so significant. You know, it's you know you're basically going from writing you know for flute to you know going into the range of of a viola. So, and just having that C below middle C, it, it, it's it's criminally underused, criminally underrated. A lot of composers have a difficult time writing for it because, especially in flute choir music, it's the projection issues. It's more than worth the trouble, is what I'm trying to say. As always, everyone, stay safe um, and send in your pieces by email. I tend to do these every four episodes or so, tend to keep it rolling. So, you know, once every month or a couple months, I'll come up with a new one. And until uh, then, keep writing, keep sending them in, keep composing.